thank you for this time and uh, for these women who I know have such receptive hearts and are so generous with their spirits of love <laughs> and understanding. Um, and so, you know, I, I just give this time to you, Lord, and I just uh, ask that it would be all of you and none of me, and uh, that you would touch the hearts of the ladies exactly where they need to be touched. Let them hear, hear you today, Lord, not me, but your voice in their heart, loving them, calling them, filling them, using them. I love you, Lord, and I, I just give this time to you, Lord, and I pray all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dearest Lord Jesus Christ, you are constantly perfecting my abilities to understand your loving work in my life. Every day I realize how much you love me. I am most happy living my life according to your will for me. And the revelation, you will experience a perfect peace in my presence. The light of my son Jesus Christ will illuminate so brightly and you will rest among all the saints that have completed a good work as you have to this day. Continue with confidence and be of good courage, knowing I am always at your side, guiding your footsteps until I call you to your eternal home. This is my revelation on day one of the scripture day. Come to me as a blank tablet that I may imprint my love upon you a heart full of joy, eyes of compassion, ears attentive to the cry of the poor, a mouth filled with a song of praise, hands ready for service, feet willing to follow me, a mind open to my word, and a soul aflame with love for me. Go forth my valentine and witness my love. Amen. Describe a person of rich soil. <laughs> How does a person become rich soil? After celebrating 35 years of Women's Christian Fellowship, there was only one person that came to my mind, and that was Angie. Uh, Angie, God planted his word in her. She listened, she meditated on his word day and night, accepted and obeyed, uh, obeyed him, and bears much fruit, 100, 30, 60, 100 fold in WCF. Here in Carlsbad, in other parts of the, and in other parts of the country, his word went forth and did not return void. Lives, hearts, and spirits were healed, restored, and transformed. Amen. Um, I'm doing B on day one. Examine the harvest from your own life and share any insights you receive. Honestly, I did not start to grow and bloom until I started in Women's Christian Fellowship. And I know I always say that, but it's true. I believe you just have to make a firm commitment to God. This life I have now is much more fulfilling than any other time in my life. If I did not have a relationship with the Lord when I had uh, cancer and became widowed in the same year, uh, I'm not sure if I would be in a good place today. But praise God, he keeps watering me with his living water, and I am blessed. I'm sharing on day 1A, uh, describe a person of rich soil. How does that person become rich soil? I think a person of rich soil is first and foremost humble. They know they have a need for God, and their minds and hearts are fixed upon him. They receive his word into their hearts, and they understand the truth of the gospel. A person of rich soil is faithful and obedient. They listen for the Lord and follow his word. A person with rich soil is more interested in heavenly things than earthly things. They are transformed by God and bear the fruit of the Spirit in the world uh, in their service to him. I think that a person becomes rich soil by the grace of God. Even our initial faith is a gift of God, but we must cooperate with that grace to really let God do in us all he wants us to do. Our first step in becoming rich soil comes with our baptism, where we initially receive the Holy Spirit, but then it comes in faith. So, becoming rich soil is at first a grace, 
then it's a choice, then it is a collaboration. The scripture this week was, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in Karen will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And of course, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Such an awesome scripture. And I wrote, Lord, this is such a hopeful scripture. It is one that helps me when I feel shaky and scared about what I'm to do and discouraged by my lack of maturity and the ways that I fall short of your great commandment to love. It helps me to remember it is truly not all up to me and that you are here with me to help me, to grace me, to show me your power and love me, to grow, to grow more fully in you. It's a lifetime project, one that we are both a part of. Sometimes I get really discouraged that I'm so old and I'm still having to learn all of these lessons I have to remember. You know, it's a lifetime project. But, um, I lost my place. It's a lifetime project, one that we are both a part of. I must not take it to me. I do not need to work or labor for you, however. I must always remember, but it is your work, not mine. You are given, you, are, you, you have given me your assignments and your power through your Holy Spirit. I've always taken this statement by St. Paul to the Philippians as an expression of his confidence in the Lord. He knows what the Lord did for him. So he knows the power of the revelation of Christ in a person's life. But I think, too, Paul saw something in the Philippians and how they embraced Christ. And that's why he can be so confident. They persevered up to that point. The sentence before this one says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my, with joy in my, I'm sorry, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. I want to say that to you guys. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. He also tells them right after it, it is right for me to feel this way about you, because I have you all in my heart. He knows what the Lord is speaking to him in his heart. He trusts it. He knows the love you have, and the love he has for you has great power with the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayers said in love are so powerful. He trusts in the faith and power of the Lord to answer his prayers. He trusts in the guidance of the Holy Spirit within that would speak the word to him. He knows the diligence that is required on their part. And he is so thankful to them for their love for the gospel and of our Lord. So Kelly talked about the collaboration, and that's what we're talking about here too. Lord, this word also gave me such hope, and still does for my family. When my son was away from your church, I trusted in his word, and in I trusted in this word, the scripture, and in your church's sacraments, and in your love for me, that if I kept on in faith and in prayer for him, you would not disappoint me. I knew you had revealed yourself to him as a small child, and that this would be something that would always be a part of his life, even though it was buried really deep. I'm not sure he fully remembered it. I kept reminding him of it, but... I remember talking with my son one day during that time about baptism. And he said to me, do you really believe that much power of baptism? Is it th that there's that much power in baptism? I knew what my own journey to you looked like and how long it took me to get to you. And so I trusted, not knowing how, but that he who began a work in my son on that day of his infant baptism would perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You answered that in a way I never expected. And now I trust that you will continue to do that for him. Thank you, Lord, for the work you begin in us, for your church who kickstarts it all in, your, in our baptism, for the prayers and love of our faithful church to support and help us 
so that when we say yes to you, we can count on you to perfect it and use it for your glory. Amen. Amen. All right, so here we are in uh, Mark 4. And I just want to go, do, go back a little bit and say it was way in chapter, chapter 1, I think it was verse 13 or 14, where he proclaims the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And then he doesn't really talk about it anymore in Mark, or Mark doesn't talk about it until, really, until chapter 4. And so I got to thinking about what kind of commotion that proclamation must have made among everybody and trying to figure out what the heck he was talking about. So um, it, it, one of the commentators said that um, uh, Matthew has his Sermon on the Mount, and Luke has his Sermon on the Plain, and Mark has his Sermon on the Sea. I really liked that. And um, so I, I'd never heard it before. And so this is where he begins to teach about, um, on the sea. Literally, he's sitting you know, in a boat on the sea. Um, and I was, was so blessed when I read this because oh, I'm talking without my, I just realized I don't know why I'm, I don't have my job. <laughs> I'm doing it from memory. <laughs> oh, that may be good, I guess. Um, so anyway, uh, I was really blessed by this because I don't know how many of you have been to the Holy Land, but I have been blessed to be have gone to the Holy Land. And I still have the picture of the Sea of Galilee on my computer screen, and that's since 19, uh, 2010. I won't take it off, I just love it so much. It was one of my favorite, favorite parts of the trip. And it was the first place we stayed in, in Galilee, um, uh, in, in Israel, was in Galilee. And our hotel was right on the lake. It's really a lake, not a sea. It's a, it's a small sea or a big lake. Um, and you can see the other side of it. You know, so when they say you went to the other side, you could see them going to the other side. Um, and uh, so I would get up in the morning. We were there three days. And honestly, you know, I, I'd walk out my door and I'd think, I'm, I'm, I'm in a sanctuary. I am on holy ground. And I'd look at that sea and I'd read my scriptures and I'd imagine all of the things that happened on that sea. And we even had a storm one night, so I got to see what it was like. Uh, with the waves coming up and just quickly, it was amazing. I got up in the morning and went, oh my gosh, no, the sea is moving, and it was amazing. Um, but anyway, I, I was so blessed to be, to be able to pray at the Sea of Galilee. But I have to tell you, the sad part was I was traveling with my two young adult kids, and most of Israel that perceives the sea as a resort area. That was like such a disconnect for me. Um, whoa, because they, they, they come here for vacations. Um, and it, it was called a resort when we were staying. And, um, and I thought to myself how like that is about our lesson this week. Because two people can see and hear and experience the same thing and have such a very different response to it. Some will take be taken to spiritual truths and revelations of God. And others will just see a lake. And that's really what this lesson's about, is our response to the word. And what, what is involved, how that comes about, and how we nurture it. Um, it's one of the things that the lesson is about, but it, it really struck me as I was reading it. So I was imagining the Lord in his boat on the sea, and uh, like an amphitheater would, it would be, you know, people kind of sitting around and his voice booming because he's out in the water, and I guess your voice carries better that way. That's one of the commentators said. Um, and who was out there listening? He had his apostles, his, his apostles, he had his committed followers, people who had already heard him and were following him, his disciples. Um, he had people coming who just heard about him as a wonder worker and was trying to go see what he was about. He had people there who needed healing and miracles in their lives and deliverance. He had people there who um, maybe were on the fence. You know, I'm not sure what I want. I want to learn more. I'm, I'm going to just keep listening until I, until I really figure out what this guy's about. And then, of course, he had the Pharisees and the scribes lurking around, waiting to catch him, you know, in something scandalous so they could um, arrest him for blasphemy. So that was his audience. Kind of a range to talk to, right? That's hard. I mean, you guys, we weren't on the same page, right, for the most part. Like, I, I, it would be very different if I had to give this teaching to that crowd, right? So, um, so Jesus' task now is about um, helping them understand what he meant when he said the kingdom of God is at hand. What, what does that mean? 
it, we, we don't get the full teaching of these parables. He just continues to explain what the kingdom of God is through parables throughout his teaching. These are just a few of them. Um, but this very this first one of the sowing of the seeds is very important because it kind of sets the tone for all the other parables because it, it teaches us how we're supposed to approach the parables. It's, 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 it's hidden in there, so we're going to talk about that. Um, what is a parable? A parable is a word picture that can be a story, a riddle, a comparison, uh, but it's, it's a picture of something that's very familiar to the, to the hearer, that they can visualize and imagine in their minds. It might even be happening while he's talking. It could have been somebody sowing seeds, for all we know, when he said that. Um, and it's meant to be heard, like almost in a conversation, to help, you know, it's, it's that should be that easy. Um, and so it's meant to be heard, and it should be very simple to understand the actual the actual story. Um, and this is really important. It's something that's easy to recall. And I thought about that a lot because I thought about when these Gospels were written and how it must have been so um, helpful to the disciples of the time to, to have these parables to go back to easily to remember because they were in a persecution. They're trying to spread the word. And these parables that they could easily reflect on had so much meaning for them that they were real sustenance for them to keep going. Um, so a par that, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to give you the reasons why the Lord was teaching in a parable. Um, that's one of them. He knew they would need something easy to recall to keep them going, you know, not a lengthy discourse. Um, so, but, it, but these parables are used to reveal a complex spiritual truth. So they're simple on the outside, very deep on the inside. To get to that inside is, the, is dictated by our response. So um, I thought in the spirit of our Lord, I would try to use a parable to explain the parable <laughs> in language you might understand. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, was, I have a master's degree in child development, and um, so we, I was doing my master's thesis on play, childhood play. And this may be something none of you know about me. I may be actually sharing something brand new. Um, and the mud of, so I watched many videos of mothers uh, with their little, little kids playing together, doing a puzzle. And um, I, video I watched hours, I have to tell you, of these, these videos. And because I had to go through it, I had to rate them and you know, put them in, make the, the study out of them. So I don't think what we learned will surprise you. I mean, it was just my little master's thesis, you know. Um, but we had some mothers, so imagine some mothers, who told their children how to do the puzzle in a very direct way, almost doing it for them. It was done pretty quickly, and it was done right. <laughs> but did the child learn how to do the puzzle? Did he learn anything in that? And I'm guessing, this wasn't part of the study, but I'm guessing it wasn't much fun for that child. Or for the mother, for that matter. Unless she really likes to do puzzles. <laughs> um, and then there were other mothers that gave very little direction at all. They mostly watched their child play, and they might give them some feedback occasionally. They might tell them when they've done something wrong. <laughs> um, um, but that child also didn't learn very well. Um, and I'm guessing it wasn't much fun or interesting for them either, either, and it was probably pretty frustrating for them. But then there were most of the mothers, and most of the mothers fall in this category because of why, we, it's why the Lord created mothers, to have that bond with their children. Um, most of these mothers just knew what to do. They broke the puzzle down. They either actually adjusted it to make it simple for, simpler for them, or they asked them questions to get them thinking and focusing on particular parts of the puzzle, maybe the shape or you know, something that would, would just trigger a thought in them. Um, and so it might have taken a lot longer for that puzzle to get done, right? It might not have been done perfectly, but guess what? Did that kid learn how to do the puzzle? Yes. Um, did he, was he engaged with his mom to learn to do that puzzle? Yes. So who's mom in the story? Jesus. Okay. Just in case, I'm going to give a little explanation because you're going to get my parable. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I like to reflect on that because I think, it, even though it was just my little master's thesis, I think actually they do trainings now where they teach mothers how to do this. It's that important 
to, to know how to connect with your kids on that level, to make play interesting, and it is play is a really critical part of your child's development, to, to have them grow and mature into, into thinking and, and, and um, well-adjusted kids, adults. So anyway, this is what Jesus was trying to do. Um, he wanted the hearers, the people in the crowd, to listen, to engage with him, to question him, to think for themselves. He wanted them to be at his feet asking questions, which some of them did do. We didn't get it. Help us understand. Um, um, and in that process of engaging with his, this parable, this teaching, it's like being in prayer with him. Because he can't, he certainly can't give everything, all the, the mysteries of God and the kingdom of God all at once. He's giving many, many parables to, do, to describe the kingdom in very different ways. But these are mysteries of God he's trying to give us, not how to solve a puzzle. This is a very complicated thing. So it's only going to happen to those who are open and willing to take that time to be with him, to listen, to believe, and to act on it. Um, it's it's got to have that heart of, I want to know this so much because it's that vital to my existence. It's going to, it's going to feed me and change me. So I am eager, eager to understand what you're saying. You know that term, hungry for God, thirsting for God. You, your life depends on it. Your spiritual life, you have that attitude. That's the heart where when God sees that heart, yes. he's going to reveal the mystery of the kingdom to that heart. Yes. Through that desire for it. It's that desire for it. Um, there is a, uh, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, there's a, it, it's Deuteronomy 6.4, it says, oh, oh, hear, oh Israel, you know, um, that, just that phrase. Well, apparently that's a very important phrase. It's, I don't, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but it's called the great Shema, Shema, Shema. Um, and it means to hear, but hear in a very particular way. Um, He's calling people not just to hear with their ears, but to listen, as I said, with an open attitude, to believe and take it into their hearts, to allow it to transform their lives, and that's the important part. The Word of God provokes and challenges us to respond and make changes in our lives. In order to be effective, it has to do that. So the hearer must come with that, with that desire for that transformation. Um, and so when every time Jesus gives a parable, he usually says this. Hear what I'm saying. Those who have ears to hear, hear. This is what he's telling them. They know this is what he's telling them because they're Jewish. Most of them probably were all Jewish. And they understand the importance of that kind of hearing. Um, Angie talked a lot yesterday in our small group, so I'm going to try to do this because um, I don't want to leave it out. She gave me her study because when she taught on this last, last time, so I, I took some notes from her study. But... Another way to express this idea is that the Word of God can be understood in four ways. It can be grafe, which be read, is meaning it's read. It can be heard, which is rene. Um, it's the logos, the living word, which is Jesus. And there's the homologia, which is Jesus living in us. This is where he wants us to be. He wants us to hear to, with homologia, Jesus in us, mixing together. Great things happen when God mixes with us. Um, so that's that. Um, so the, I got very confused. I don't know how many of you ladies got very confused with that verse 12. To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. He's quoting um, the Isaiah scripture, and they know that's where it's coming from when they hear it. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this, because I think it is very confusing. Um, I spent a lot of time going, Lord, surely you wanted the people to understand and be transformed. We know this. It doesn't make any sense that you would talk in a way that people would understand it. And that's the whole point of what you're doing. So I, I, I fretted about this. And, and, and I, uh, when I read the commentaries, um, they clarified it for me. And I was getting it as I was doing the study. but. But basically, when he talks about, the, the, the disciples have come and they've said, you know, help us understand the parable that he read. And he's telling them that, he's, he's going to explain it to them, but he, he talks about the, the fact that the people from the outside um, 
are, are not, it's not for the people outside. And so the key is, what does he mean by the people who are outside? Um, and those are the people who are outside the, that faith belief that I was talking about earlier. They don't come with that receptive heart. They don't really come to listen, to hear, to change, to transform, to believe in what he's saying, to accept it and want it to feed them and, and change them. And so those people, when they come to hear the parable, it's not that he's deliberately not wanting them to hear it. They can't because they don't have that receptive heart. So they're not going to get the mystery. It's not that he's making it because he wants it to happen. It's that their response is making that happen in them. So the Isaiah scripture is a prophecy of what happens. And he's fulfilling that, but it's not what he wants. He wants them all to get it. And then there's another thing I thought of while I was doing the lesson about why he might speak in parables. And that is those lurking Pharisees and scribes. Um, that they're, in speaking in parables, he is sharing the teaching in a way that he's not likely to say anything blasphemous, right? They're not going to get it because they're not, they don't have receptive hearts. And if they can't have receptive hearts, they're not going to want to arrest him for blasphemy, right? So, so he, he's going to win with this, with this way of teaching. And so I, I, and I was a little bit nervous about even expressing that. And then St. Augustine said that in one of the commentaries. I went, oh, good, I can share it. <laughs> one saint said the same thing. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Um, so um, anyway, so that's, that's why, I hope that clears up why he's speaking in parables for you. Um, so now the, the poor apostles, you know, he, they say, we don't, we, don't under, okay, we don't understand the parable. And he says, how will you understand the parable? It's like, you know, you're my, you're my disciples. But that's how I read it the first time. And then when I was doing the lesson, I thought, oh, no. He said, how will you understand the parable? And then he explains the parable to them because the answer is in the parable. <laughs> it's the parable of the rich soil. They will understand the parable when they're rich soil. So he's, he's kind of going to tell them how they're going to understand the parables. Um, so let's read the parable of the sower. Um, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out now, went out to sow. As he was sowing, some fell beside the road, and the birds came up and ate it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then right after that, the twelve said, we don't, we don't get it. So, um, then he has to give his explanation. So um, I want to share with you um, my story <laughs> about being all the different kinds of soil there is at some point in my life, pretty much. And in 1992, that was the first year I had to teach for Angie. And when I saw what the topic was, I know, phew. Um, and when I saw what the topic was, I went, oh my gosh, I think I've had to teach on that before. And I went digging through my stuff. And this is so fun because in the, in the closet this morning, Debbie Newby had a word, a vision of, say what your vision was again, Debbie. Oh, okay. Um, while we were praying over Karen, I saw a watering can it was pouring holy water over Karen. And then a pink tulip came up, rose up, and opened up, and then there was an egg in the middle of the tulip. And you know, I'm not a great artist, like I'm not a musician, but uh, this is my drawing. <laughs> and I can't, I didn't draw a tulip, but it's close. Uh, it's a flower. Um, and I drew this when I did the, the lesson. And I thought of it exactly when you, when you shared it, that, um, that this is what the Lord was, was saying to me anyway. Um, yeah, you already shared this. Um, I, it's just, it's such a funny drawing, isn't it? Which is my favorite. <laughs> so if you can see it, um, this is the seed. Uh, in the ground, just starting to sprout. <laughs> and this is the seed sprouting, and it's developing some roots. And I have down the roots, where at this point in my life, there was a lot of prayer and a lot of scripture, and of course, it started with the very root of Christ himself. I had committed myself to him, and I was, it was before WCF, uh, but I was going to Bible studies, I came back to the church, and I was, I was uh, just 
you know, reading as much as I could in, in scripture. And, um, and I was sprouting, look at that. <laughs> um, and then, this is what happened to me when I came to WCF. And so the difference for me, um, the very first retreat, Barbara, Barbara Graham prayed with me. I was so like leery of that retreat. It was just you know, healing. I should go home. I should go home. And I was not comfortable at all. And um, they had a prayer time, and Barbara was there, and I felt really safe with Barbara. Where is she? Where's Barbara Graham? Is she here? I don't see her. Um, anyway, um, she, I went up to her and I said, uh, "She said, what do you want?" For, I, I, I vowed that I would. I vowed that I would stay the weekend and I would participate in everything because I did not want the ladies to feel bad. I didn't want to do anything that would make them feel uneasy that I wasn't participating. It was really hard for me though. I, it wasn't easy. So I, but I did that, and um, so I went for prayer and I was really scared. And I remember she said to me, what do you want prayer for? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> this is where I was. <laughs> I don't know. And um, she said, well, okay, that's hard, but I'll pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she did. I wish she were here. Um, anyway, so she prayed for me. And she said, the Lord is going to make you much more confident. I'm like, oh, that's a good thing. That's okay. That's not so scary. That's I thought mean, she was going to find some deep, dark secret, which I knew all those secrets that were in there she could have found out about and talked about. I said, okay, that's okay. And I went through that retreat, and of course, that was when I uh, was slain in the spirit, uh, even, though, even though I didn't want to be. I stood up and spoke in tongues, even though I didn't want to. <laughs> because remember, I had said, I will participate as you lead me, Lord. And he was leading me, even though it was difficult. So... Uh, people had prayed for me for the baptism of the Holy Spirit before the retreat, but that was where the, the fruit first started to come, you know, out of my obedience to that retreat, even though it was hard. Um, and so from there, we start to go fear, because this is what fellowship does. Um, and I guess what I want to say about fellowship is we normally think of fellowship, I think my husband thinks this, oh, she has fun with all those friends, you know, and I do. He doesn't understand what fellowship really is. Um, and I have here, well, let me just, I want to go backtrack a little bit. When I was in this phase, um, I was beginning to have ears that would hear the word, the scripture, and your ears will hear a word behind you. This is Isaiah 30, 21. This is the way, walk in it, whatever, whatever, whenever, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. So I was beginning to be able, I was able to do that. You know, I was hearing the Lord, wasn't very confident, but I was moving, you know, I was doing what I thought he was telling me to do, mostly through scripture, but I was moving and, um, and growing. But what happens in fellowship is that fellowship is the time where we have the opportunity to love. Right? If you aren't in fellowship, how do you love anyone? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and so we have the opportunity to love and we have the opportunity to receive love. We have the opportunity to give mercy. We have the opportunity to be mercy. We have the opportunity to be patient with those of, when we're, with those of us who are impatient. That's, that's our work. That's where we bring fruit in fellowship. So that's why we can, we can start to begin to show the fruit, and we can begin to give the fruit. And, and I guess the egg bring new life into other people, because she has saw an egg in her, I don't have an egg on my flower, but she saw an egg in, the, in her flower. And, um, and, but the new life that we, we bring to each one another um, through Jesus. So I read something, maybe some of you read it recently, um, and it was alluded to in the, in the Mass this morning, um, about brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're a Mass, you heard what Father said. But there was in Magnificat, there was a story um, a few days ago about St. Martin de Tours. I hope I'm saying that right. Did you, have you ever read it? Mm -hmm. I thought it was so beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. I sent it to my son. My son gave me a candle with him on it because he was so, like, just in awe of the, how he gave the cloak and so forth. Well, I didn't understand that he actually divided the cloak. The story of St. Saint, Saint Martin is that he was on a horse, and he sees a, a person who needs a coat, and he takes his cloak, and he, this is when he's a catechumen, so he's kind of just got, has just come back into the church, or just coming into the church, and he slices the cloak in half, and he gives half to the, to the beggar, and he keeps half for himself. And... Why that's important is because in fellowship, we're equal. We're not 
better than each other. And that's what he was saying to the beggar. If he had given him the whole cloak, he would have been saying, I'm better than you, I don't need it. Or I'm going to suffer more, I can suffer more than you, you're poor, you can't. He, he gave dignity to that beggar by giving him half the cloak. And that's what we do to one another when we're in fellowship. Um, and so it's, it's, we, we hear a lot about serving the poor, and that's important, and those kinds of works. But the work we do in fellowship with one another is really important. It's, it's where we bear a lot of fruit for each other. Um, so that's my, little, that's my little story about that. Um, but the soil. Let's talk about the soil a little bit more. Um, in, the, in, the, in the, I got my pages all mixed up, sorry. Let me go back to this. In the, in the parable, the sower is Jesus. And anyone, he gives the task of sowing. So that's you and us. We're all sowers, all right? The seed is the word of God. It is Jesus and his gospel message and anything else he wants to teach about the kingdom, you know, he's going to plant. Anything he wants to give you in truth, he's going to plant. That's all seed. His love is seed. It's all seed that he's planting in us. The important thing is that the seed in the parable is being tossed everywhere. The sower doesn't stop and think, should I put it there? It might take root there. It's just going everywhere. And that's because we never know what's going to happen to that seed after we sow it. It could sit on that soil, that rocky soil, or that path, for, and not get um, taken. It could sit on that rocky, rocky path. The rocks could be removed. It could get the wind could blow it someplace else. We don't know what's going to happen. It could eventually take root, deep roots. Um, and so the parable is, is about the variety of ways that people can respond. And the, the interesting thing about this is, remember the crowd of people that I told you about? Um, Jesus is actually acting out the parable in front of them. So he's telling the parable, and he's also being the sower. He doesn't ever say, I'm the sower, but he is being the sower. And he's got that crowd of different responses out there, and he's giving a message to them. Um, and those people are responding as they will. So the, the seed that falls beside the road, these are the times where, and, and we have to, remember I said parables are meant to provoke and challenge us, right? So these are the times we hear something, maybe, the, maybe it's the first time you hear the gospel message and you think it's just too good to be true or it's just cuckoo, okay? Or you think the person is cuckoo and you just dismiss it. And plenty of people do that. I did that. Um, so, but even now, we could hear something that doesn't really ring, doesn't register, and we don't, maybe it kind of ruffles our feathers a little bit, and we want to dismiss it right away. Um, but on reflection, we recognize that maybe I better pay attention to that, right? So it's easy even now to do that, to just be, let the seed of the Lord, or uh, maybe somebody wants to give you something, and you kind of go, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, what are you refusing, you know? Um, so we, all of us can be these soils even now, is the point I'm trying to make. It's, 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 it, it happens also, it's how we respond to Jesus when we first hear the word, but it's also how we continue to respond to him as we, as we go through life. The rocky soils are those times where you're just so excited, we just, oh yeah, I can do that, or yeah, I'll do that. For me, uh, personally, I, I was baptized in the church, so I had the gifts of, you know, given to me, the Holy Spirit given to me, and the gifts of faith, hope, and love to be able to, to, to have that revealed word and understand it when it was given to me. And as a child, I was a believer, but it was very immature. I didn't pray. I didn't really, we didn't go to Mass in my home except for the, the holy days, you know, the holidays. Um, and so I didn't really have a practice of my faith to look at, to model, to do. Um, but I was always attracted to holiness. I always thought it was like so wonderful. I remember seeing the inner sixth happiness and just kind of, um, um, is it really 11, 20 to 12? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I have to wind down. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh oh. Um, anyway, really quickly, um, I remember seeing that movie and just being so struck. If you've seen it, it's about a missionary and, and, and it's a true story. Um, and, and just wanting that so bad. And I guess God knew that I, there was that hunger in me down there and I didn't put, even put a name on it. Um, so, but then we also have the thorns, and all of us can relate to the thorns in our lives and how we can get distracted by 
wanting these other things and attachments that we know are not good, and to food, to material things, to all sorts of things that we struggle with in our lives. And then there's the rich soil that Ele um, Kelly so eloquently talked about. So I won't go over the description of the rich soil, but what we do for one another in fellowship is we help cultivate the rich soil in each other. And what we, what, how we respond to the Lord determines whether we're going to produce 30, 60, or 100-fold. We have, we have a choice. Um, and so the end of this parable is really good news because there's going to be a big crop. And it's good news for those, those apostles and disciples that are, that are uh, you know, trying to spread the church in the early centuries because they need to know there's going to be a big crop. They need to trust that word because they're not going to see it, certainly. And we think we have it hard when we're praying for somebody and we're not seeing the results, right? Think about how they felt. So I'm um, trying to think how I can summarize this really quickly. Um, the parable, he goes on to give the parable of the lamp, um, and this parable is, the Lord asks, the Lord is telling them, my kingdom may not be shining right now, but it will be. Okay. And he also is telling us in this parable, as he's telling me, that I need to let my light shine. And I need to let that light shine in places that I am ashamed to let him see. So the challenge for us, of course, is to bring those difficult areas to him in prayer, in confession, with another person, so they can be brought to light and healed. The parable of the measure, how generous are we? If we, we get what we put in, how many times have you, you you've said it to your kids, you get what you put in? If we pray, if we worship, if we study, he's going to give us so much in, in response to that amount of time that we give him. And uh, by the, conversely, if we don't do those things, we're going we're gonna to die because that's sustenance to us. So that we lose everything we have. We need to, to continually be pouring out and giving out in order to receive and to keep going. Um, you were encouraged to contact somebody this week, um, and I hope you did that either by mail or, or by phone call. I, I just have to share this, and I'll share it quickly. What the Lord did for me during this lesson was amazing. Um, I normally, you know, would be, my go-to would be the ladies here, you know, share a person who's been a light in your life, and you all are, you know you are. Um, and, but the Lord put somebody outside WCF in my heart to reflect on, and that is a woman named Lori. Um, and who's very dear in my life. She was my, my husband, my, my father's uh, girlfriend, um, after my mom passed away. And I haven't spoken with her since the summer, and I've been really worried about her. I tried. I left. She was traveling, and I tried. I left messages with her daughter, emailed. I left messages at home, never called me back. My sisters hadn't heard from her. I was really getting worried. She's, she's old, and she has vascular degeneration, so I can't really send her a note because she can't read very well. Um, so conversation is the best way to talk with her. So I prayed about her because I reflected on the amazing light she was in our lives during a very dark time when we, when, when we lost, lost my mom. My dad was devastated. Honestly, I don't think he would have survived without her. She gave him 10 more years of good life. And, um, and she put up with a lot from us because we had a really hard time with it at first. We were like, are you kidding? We never imagined that our dad would ever, ever date anybody else. <laughs> really. I mean, just as a child, don't get that. And I remember when my sisters called to tell me that he had his girlfriend. I was in shock. I, went to, I just took myself as fast as I could up to Mass. And, <laughs> and that's the other point I wanted to make. The church and the importance of the church and, and keeping rich soil. Um, I come to Mass, and I, I'm, cr I'm crying, I'm in Mass, and I'm like, Lord, help me understand. So I'm leaving, and there's Helen. Helen's not here, but those of you who know Helen know how dear she is. And she's like, Karen, how are you? And I just started to cry. <laughs> I couldn't be, I looked at her, and I had to be, the light I had to be honest. I couldn't tell her I was okay, and I really didn't want to share this with anyone. It was too fresh. But I did. I shared it with her. I didn't know what she was going to think about my dad, you know. And she's like, oh, dear Karen, dear, dear. It's okay. Really, she is a gift. And she just told me exactly what I needed to hear. The body of Christ is amazing. She knew exactly what to tell me. So I knew I had to buck up and accept this and with and accept this with generosity. And um, she then went on to nurse my dad during his illness till he died. 
And uh, so she's very dear to me. And, uh, and she did put up with so much. She never, never, never acted bitter, said a bitter word. She was, she was so generous towards my mom, always lifting her up in whatever way she could. She was a, del she's a delight. And my Uncle Pat, who met her, just called her a gem. He said, she's such a gem. You know she's such a gem. I said, she's a gem. So <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't call her. I, she wasn't answering the phone, and I couldn't reach her. So the second day of my lesson, I'm in the middle of my lesson, and I get a phone call from her. I did call, I did call her, and I left a message, because I wanted to share this with her. So I did hear from her the next, very next day that I wrote this. And we had a lovely conversation. And she is Gonna, she has an MRI, she may have some real issues going on in her life that could be very serious, and in her typical fashion, she was, but you know, the Lord gives us this stuff for, to build our strength. I don't always understand, but I, I look out the window, I, I can still see the, the trees, and she's, you know, she's lifting me up, and I'm like, oh, you know, and um, so, but then I was able to, I was able to give her something, because she gave us so much, now it was time for me to be able to, to give what I could at that moment was my faith and my love for her. And so I prayed with her, of course, and I read her what I wrote, and she started to cry. She said, please send it to me. I still can read if I take time. And I said, I'll put it in really big print for you. Um, and so it was such a gift. So if you didn't write the letter and you didn't call them, please do that, uh, because I had no idea she was going through what she was going through. And um, that is how we are the body of Christ and we lift each other up. And you are the body of Christ, and you lift me up and you lift each other up. And so, um, though I didn't talk about the, the, the mustard seed, I did want to just say one thing about that. Um, that because that's the church. Yeah. And it's really important that we get the role that our church plays, um, you know, from baptism, through all the sacraments, through the prayer warriors we have in our church, through our homilies, our mass. This is what it keeps us with rich soil. And so the, these are the choices we make that can cause us to, to keep rich soil or not. So our church, I, I want to share this one little story. My son, when he first came back to the church, he said, we went to Mass in the morning, and um, he came home and he said, Mom, do you know there are ladies in that church that are praying for the world? He had heard the rosary being prayed, and that little Fatima prayer, you know? Um, and, uh, and he said, they pray for people they don't know. <laughs> he was so blown away and impressed by that level of faith and confidence in prayer. So all those prayers are prayed every day. Those rosaries are prayed for the church, for us, for those souls that are still, the seed is still sitting on rocky ground. Who knows what's going to happen with that seed because of the power of prayer in our church. Don't stop praying for your loved ones who you don't see the fruit. It'll come. Amen. Amen. Amen.